How you doing? Okay, make sure you can pick, now, so you can pick up my voice, right? Can you hear Gene? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Can you hear me? All right. Well, we're here today with uh, former Mayor Boyd Dunn, uh, who was mayor with the city of Canlan from 2002 to 2010. Yes, yeah, so far the longest serving mayor in the history of Chandler. Uh, in a couple of months that won't be the case, <laughs> but anyway. Um, today is uh, May 14, 2011, and this is a series that we're doing where we're interviewing all the past mayors and getting Good. kind of their history, their personal history, as well as their experience with the city of Chandler and, you know, giving us some good stories about that so we can record that for the future. So Good. Um, we'll start a little bit with your family history. Okay. Um, what's the name of your father and where was he from originally? My father's name, uh, I'll even give you his middle name for a reason. He, he, would, uh, he would not like me to do that, but it was James Sylvester Dunn. And he was, um, he was born in Niagara Falls. Uh, long line of generations. As a matter of fact, Sylvester comes from, I believe, would be my great-great-grandfather who fought in the 132nd Regiment of the Pennsylvania Volunteers during the Civil War. And his first name was Sylvester, Sylvester Green. And I only mention that because um, there's a plaque in our house that, uh, that indicates all those who survived in his regiment and things of that sort. And he survived the Civil War. And he was a color bearer. In other words, whether he was very brave or just very foolish, we don't know, but he carried the flag in all the battles that, that they had. And they had some very significant battles and he survived. I mean, to me, you carry that flag, you're kind of the target. But um, my father uh, went to Ohio State University, uh, ROTC program, went in the Army, got a commission as a commission officer after he um, got out of college and served 32 years in the um, Army, uh, retired as a colonel, and, uh, and uh, had a couple of, um, couple of tours in Germany and had five, five tours in the Pentagon. And, uh, had a very uh, great career, fought in the South Pacific during World War II in, in uh, New Guinea and those areas. In uh, World War II, when he was in the South Pacific, what, uh, what area was, was he in infantry? Or? He was in the Corps Master Corps. So he, um, he had a truck division, and uh, his responsibility was to make certain that the supplies got where they needed to go. And uh, it was a very difficult thing during that time, and, and, uh, but um, he made certain that um, all the maneuvers the, and everything got to, to the soldiers and um, never was captured but had a number of uh, uh, his, uh, his um, division was attacked quite often because the Japanese were oft often trying to cut off the supplies the troops needed. Um, then after World War II he got into the area of testing, testing equipment that the military would use and was in the Pentagon um, for that reason, did a lot of uh, testing of equipment and, and traveled extensively, uh, tested equipment up in the Ant Antarctica area, um, tested equipment in the desert, tested equipment all, all over the world that the, um, the military decided to purchase and use uh, for the soldiers. Okay. Yeah. Was he born in Ohio? No, he was born in uh, Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, Buffalo area, he grew up. He met my mom there. Uh, my mother, uh, Kathleen Ruth Dunn, actually was an immigrant. Um, to the United States. She was born in Canada, Midland, Ontario. Her parents were British and they came over um, and then she, um, they moved to Niagara Falls, Buffalo area. Uh, she would say on the other side of the tracks from my, my father's family, but uh, both went to Niagara Falls High School, still, still there. Um, and she eventually became a U.S. citizen when my father got his commission <laughs> in the, uh, in the, back in those days it wasn't really uh, something that he had to do right away. Um, but she became a U.S. citizen when he got his commission in the military. Uh, just went back and celebrated the 100th birthday of one of my aunts. Uh, uh, the oldest aunt just turned 100 years old um, and uh, still lives by herself in Buffalo through the winters of, of New York. And, um, and I haven't asked her if she's a U.S. citizen yet. <laughs> but uh, my dad was very, he, he, uh, he wanted to get out of Niagara Falls and, and by going to Ohio State, ROTC scholarship, he was able to uh, find his way out of New York um, uh, and, uh, and lived mostly again in Germany and in Virginia until we moved out here to Arizona. What's her maiden name? Dibbon. 
Dibbon. Very British name. Uh, D, no, it's D-I-B-B-E-N, Dibbon. And uh, she was so English, she would wear orange on St. Patrick's Day. Um, but, uh, um, but her parents uh, came over here just for opportunities and, and, uh, and ended up um, living in, in uh, New York. She did for a while. I remember growing up, uh, she was, uh, she did some uh, volunteer as a nurse, I, a candy striper, I remember they were used to be called or something of that sort. But you know, thinking back, she worked extensively back in those days being, uh, being an officer's wife was, um, had a lot of responsibility. I mean, we never lived in a place more than three years. Uh, uh, she would just, you know, be so organized. I, I would know that we'd be moving because suddenly I'd see her packing boxes again. And, um, you know, they did a lot of entertaining, uh, especially in, in those years. Uh, and, and so she was a, she helped my father through his career. And, um, and uh, looking back, I realized how, how much work that was. Mm -hmm. Now, when were you born? I was born in 1952. Um, in the city of Augsburg, Germany. It's uh, named after Caesar Augustus. It used to be one of his vacation towns, I guess. It's in southern Germany by Munich, uh, München, um, Birches Garden area. And uh, my father was stationed there. And then uh, came back to, to the States and then went over later and uh, lived in, in the area of Frankfurt, Germany, in northern Germany, and, and went through um, early years of grade school at uh, elementary school number two. Um, back in those days, we were, the, the American families were quite segregated from the German families, which was unfortunate because I think it would have been a great opportunity to get more of a cultural uh, feel. But, um, but those were the days in, in the 60s when you know, the Americans were still the conquerors, so to speak. But it, it was a wonderful experience. I uh, was able to see a lot, a lot of the world that uh, as a young young person that I think gave me my, uh, my taste for wanting to travel and see things. Mm -hmm. Do you have dual citizenship? I did. I did have dual citizenship and I remember very distinctly we were living in Washington DC. I went down to, it used to be the main post office is on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's now, it's, a, 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 it's where the immigration office used to be. It's a big clock tower building there. It's still there today. And I remember going in there, <clears throat> and I was 13 years old, and you had to make a choice whether you're going to be a U.S. citizen. And I always thought, what if I said, I would like to be a German citizen. I wonder if I'd been put in a car and driven away. But, uh, yeah, I was a dual citizen and, and made that choice. Uh, I remember filling out those forms, and my dad, you know, it was a, took me off. You know, my brother and I, I have a twin brother. Um, and so um, I remember doing it together and making that choice. But. I, as I said, I have a, a twin brother who lives in Chandler, uh, works in Chandler. Um, he's uh, three minutes older than I am, so Bruce, and it comes in very handy during campaign season. Uh, I wish it did, but he, he doesn't have an interest in politics, but, uh, um, but um, he's married and has two children. I, I'm married and have two children also, and, and then I have an older, an older sister, uh, nine years older than I am, who lives in the Chicago area and has never forgiven the fact that my brother and I were born nine year, when she was nine years old and, and suddenly she was no longer the princess. That these two, these two other aliens kind of invaded her space. But uh, What's no, What's Judy, Judy. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, she was nine years old. When I lived in Germany, she was going um, to high school at Frankfurt, uh, uh, main high school, as American high school there, along with Priscilla, and being dated by a certain person named as, known as Elvis. He would come by and pick her up, and she was a, it was a classmate of hers, so I remember her telling stories about this, uh, about that, and I could care less who Elvis Presley was at that time, <laughs> but, but no, she's a great older sister and keeps us in line. I um, actually met your brother one time, mistakenly. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, he was um, uh, uh, the only. You know, I, I've I've lost a lot of weight, but and and he's never. Um, he was he was liar and I am. So people would meet him and say, "Gosh, you've lost weight quite quickly." 
now he's losing some more weight, and I, I'm still angry at him. But, uh, but uh, I used to always kid him. I said, well, if someone comes up to you and, and says, hi, please be nice and say hi back. <laughs> so, you know, and, oh, I will, I will. But um, yeah, he's put up with the fact that, uh, that you know, perfect strangers would come up to him on occasion. But they come up to me, too, thinking I'm Bruce. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can pay him back. Okay. So um, you were born in Germany, and it seems like you probably grew up in a lot of different places, right? Yeah. Mainly, um, again, we never lived a, in a place more than three years, but it was mainly between Virginia and, and Germany, northern Virginia. Again, my father had <clears throat> five tours of the Pentagon. I remember very vividly. Um, you know, taking me to the Pentagon uh, um, as a young as a young boy and, and giving a tour of this huge facility and 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 uh, and he, um, he he worked there. He told me one story it was kind of funny. This, uh, before we, you know, um, he had lived in Washington so so many years. He used to he used to jog in, on the mall um, in the Washington D.C. mall. And, and uh, back in those days, um, the President of the United States used to walk around the mall. He used to take his secret service. Things were very different. And he was jogging around the Washington Monument and, um, and, uh, and wasn't looking where he was going and plowed right into this individual who was, uh, who was the president. And he was just aghast. And, and the security came over and checked on things and Truman was great. He said, I don't, don't, you know, it's, it's okay. You weren't, you know, I was kind of cutting in front of you. I didn't mean that. He thought it was all over until, you know, uh, a couple months later he had a meeting briefing the president on, on an issue um, at the White House and uh, and he was with a group of other people and he said he'll never forget the day Truman just was looking at him and in the middle of the meeting said don't I know you from somewhere <laughs> and I said well dad what do you say I couldn't have said, you know I, I wasn't going to say in front of all my all my uh, uh, fellow employees and staff that oh yeah I was the guy that ran into you at the, <laughs> around the Washington Monument. He said, Mr. President, I, I know we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, but uh, but he he um, uh, he had a lot of uh, years at the Pentagon. We lived in Arlington and went through schools there. Uh, I was thinking about the number of schools I went to. Uh, I was counting two elementary schools, uh, three different junior high schools, believe it or not and two different high schools. Um, but that was the nature of the beast. Uh, but um, we lived in northern Virginia. Then the last tour he had was in Fort Lee, Virginia, which is down in, by Richmond, in Petersburg, Virginia, before he moved out here. So tell me what it was that brought your family to Arizona. Retirement, actually. Um, I had never been west of the Mississippi. Um, and, uh, and my father, um, in those days, you just didn't know where you're going to go. You got you basically almost by the time you were going out the door. He said, oh, by the way, by the way, we're going to a new new a new house. But uh, he had applied for a couple of jobs after he retired, and uh, uh, he had a choice between um, working for Walt Disney World. Uh, um, he was going to be head of their purchasing and contract and thing. I thought that was super. I, I found about afterwards, and I said, well, "Gosh, Dad, I mean, free passes." But that, but. Disney World had, would not open for another year, and I was starting my freshman year in, in, uh, in um, high school, and so my dad decided to come out to Arizona instead. And he headed up the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs in Phoenix and, uh, and came out here when he retired. And, and uh, our first house was down on Thomas Road, an apartment uh, by North High School. I went to North High School my first year. I loved it at North High School. I, I was just... That was a cool, cool place to be, but they decided when they bought a home to buy it out in this little suburb town of Tempe, and, and so we moved out there and went the last three years to McClintock High School. When did you move to Tempe? Um, well, graduated in 71, moved out there probably 1969. Yeah, yeah we came out in 68, and so we had a year in, in North High School. I remember moving out here late. It was like in October after school had started, and and uh, in my t mother's typical fashion, you know, she was used to those type of things. You know, timing is never perfect in the military. And I remember having a meeting, and they were telling, um, telling her that, you know, we would have to miss the year. You know, we'd have to sell for a year. And she would not accept that. <laughs> and so uh, she convinced them that I, I, we could go in there and make up all the work. And, and uh, so the pressure was on my brother and I, but we survived. But uh, 
She said, no, they're not going to miss a year of school. <laughs> Well, I went to McClintock. Oh, McClintock. Yeah. And I have to correct, I didn't mean to correct you, but in those days, Tempe and McClintock were the two rival schools. Right. We used to have our football games at Sunnyville Stadium, which was a big deal, but now, you know, it's, there's more than two, two high schools. McClintock was a brand new school. Um, you know, it, it's hard to believe, but at that time was out in the middle of fields. It was on the edge of Tempe. Tempe kind of ended at Southern and, uh, bless you. She just sneezed. You wouldn't know that. That's amazing how people can do that. That's bad for your brain. You don't know. Um, but uh, it was a new school. Um, it was exciting. They had a, I, you know, I was a swimmer. They had this beautiful Olympic-sized swimming pool. They had a great band. I was involved in the band, and, and it was just a, it was a fun school. It was all, all people from everywhere because uh, it, it just, there were no neighborhoods. They were being built around the school. So it was in the early years when, um, when everything was being created and new, new teachers and everything was, was, uh, was new. So it was very different from North High School, which was a very established, you know, I think it was, what, the second high school in the Phoenix Union High School it was PU, Phoenix Union, and then Northern and, and West High School and things. So it was, it was, very, it was very different, um, uh, but it was fun. Um, in American history, mm -hmm. kind of, you're this young man going to high school, and you're in the Tempe area, which has a university. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what you remember about um, the Vietnam War, that time period, and some of the things you might have seen in Tempe while you were. Um, you know, it, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, you know, McClintock High School then was very different than it is today. You know, I've been back. Um, um, you know, there. McClinton High School is a, a school of enormous diversity right now. Back then, it was just basically middle class uh, families, uh, mainly Caucasian families. Uh, uh, we were worried about the Vietnam War, but our age was at a stage that you know we didn't. We we're all hoping that Vietnam would be over by then. You know, I had discussions with my dad um, you know, about about the war. I mean, I, I think as a military family, you know, you you supported it, but you saw all those things happening on the TV. Uh, it was it was it was tough, but it was just kind of a in the 70s there was just kind of a time when, when like you say, you were in high school, uh, meeting new friends, uh, forming relationships, um, active in, in, the, in, you know, in the band and clubs and things of that sort. It was just uh, those fun years. I remember um, being on the swim team, uh, we came out to Chandler High School for a swim meet once. And boy, that was a big deal. I tell you, that was the long, longest trip I've ever been to. That was, our, that was our way. It seemed like it would take forever to get to Chandler. You went on this narrow two-lane road out and found this little town you thought was just north of Tucson and had a swim meet in the old, the old pool, which no longer exists. And that was, uh, that was kind of a big deal. But everything was new. Everything was growing. Um, you know, Fiesta Mall was, was opening, and, and it, was, it was just the in place to be. Well, you know, at ASU, when I, you know, I went to ASU, I, I lived in Tempe for 10 years, and I went to, um, and so ASU was there. It was a great, you know, it was a uh, place to be. All, most of our friends went, went with, with me that year. I remember ASU, it got a lot more involved. I, they had a very famous rally around the flagpole, uh, a protest. I remember just kind of watching it, and it was, you know, it was a, it was nothing compared to what was happening at Berkeley and things of that sort. And there was a chief that I thought was handled it so well. It, it, it's actually a point of history. His name was Chief Duffy. Um, and um, and the, the students really wanted to lower the, the, the flag to half mass. And the administration was saying, no way, no way. So they called the police out there. And this kind of, in those days, the, and today, the police at ASU actually carry guns. You know, they're, they're, they're a legitimate police force. I mean, this is kind of a scary type of thing. And, and so here you had the students and you had administration just, you know, uh, confronting them, each other on this issue of the, of the flag. And it was this main flagpole, and, you know, by in the middle of campus. Chief Duffy came out and said, fine. He went over there, lowered the flag down to half mass, and then raised it up. The students were impressed. Administration said, oh, it diffused the whole thing. 
So he, he, he found a way to go out and solve the issue on both sides and prevent a bigger issue. And that always impressed me. He was very popular with, with the students. He was no nonsense. He, was, you know, he, he, was, he would get up and speak in his Boston accent and everything else. But he knew what he had to do just to, you know, hey, no big deal. We'll, 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 we'll do this simple thing. I'll take the full responsibility. And he was there until we retired years later. So it, it was there, and, and that was the years when they, had the, they went to the lottery for the draft, and we all got our numbers, and, and certainly, uh, certainly I, would have, I would have gone. I, I remember, though, um, when I did graduate, I got a four-year Army R ROTC scholarship uh, to go before I went to ASU, and, and um, ASU had an ROTC program. I remember talking to my dad about whether I should go with the um, scholarship or not, and he said, you know, he actually didn't encourage me to because he knew the military had changed so much and he knew that the military would change even after Vietnam and uh, I think he just felt like you know it's okay if you don't decide to go that route so I always look back and wonder if things would have been different if I took that opportunity but um, but uh, was there for seven years with undergrad and then law school at ASU. And I want to go back a little bit thinking about uh, during your childhood we're kind of going along the same issue of like major um, political social events that mm -hmm. happen. Very much so. Um, I was going to school at Jackson, Stonewall Jackson Elementary School in, in Virginia, and I remember getting the news. And uh, the vivid memory I had was one student who just reacted in a way that, you know, it, it was so devastating to us. Um, because back then, you, you felt like you were closer to the, to the president because he was just across the river, so to speak. He was living in your neighborhood. And this one student just said something like, uh, it was not a cheer, but she, you know, um, she, she reacted in a way where the, t uh, where the uh, a teacher asked her to leave the room for a while and everything else. And I, um, it's just, it was uh, uh, just a numbing thing. That whole, that whole time period, the 68 especially, with the later assassinations, um, it, 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 you really had to work hard not to get cynical about, about the future. Um, um, and, and so um, I remember, it's the only time I remember my mother just crying out of control. I came home and she was sitting in front of the TV and just crying. And, and you just didn't know what to do as a young boy. You know, you just, you just felt horrible. And um, you just felt like the world was ending. Um, I, I, my, my father, I remember my father um, a couple days after, a few days after the assassination said that, um, uh, I want you to go with me. And, we, and he was able to have arrangements where we went to the funeral at Arlington when Kennedy was, was buried. I remember standing on the hill. They had an they had area where, where a number of people were standing. But we were close enough to see everyone involved. I remember Charles de Gaulle the most because he was so tall. He had the biggest nose I've ever seen on a person. <laughs> but just watching that. And, and so you, you saw it on TV, but you also were, you, you were there personally. And, um, and uh, um, it, it's just, it made a major impression. Um, and both my parents are buried in, in Arlington right now. I remember my father um, had full military honors in, in Arlington a few years back. And um, all that memory came back because the full military honors was exactly what was given to President Kennedy. And, um, and so here we were, you marched through Arlington Cemetery behind the caisson with the riderless horse with a boot backwards and with a full band playing and, and had full, I had no idea. I mean, I had no idea that um, that was going to happen until we actually got there and they said, it's going to be full military honors for your father. So that all those memories came back and, and um, uh, he's, he's laid to rest right just a stone throw away from the Kennedy grave site. So um, whenever I go back to D.C., I always make a point of, of going there. there there's um, Arlington, when we lived there, was uh, a much more private place. Um, it was where we would go after church. We would go to church at Fort Myer and go have a picnic in Arlington. Um, it was not a public place. The public was really not allowed. Um, I remember one story. My sister was actually 
there with my father once, skiing and drink water. My dad loved to go to Arlington because this is a beautiful park area. And um, and spend uh, and this car came by, a big black limousine, the window rolled down, and and he heard this voice saying, "Hi, little lady, how are you doing?" And my sister <laughs> turned around. She was a little girl at that time. It was President Eisenhower, because the president would also go to Arlington uh, just to. It was a place to go and just kind of relax. It was away from the hustle and bustle of Washington, D.C. Obviously, it's changed quite a bit, um, you know, with, uh, with how it's become a tourist area. But it's still, still a peaceful place. I always have a lot of emotions going there. It was interesting. Um, I had a very different reaction. I, I, I really, I, it made me angry because growing up in the military, the, the military exposed you to integration before it ever happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the civilian world. I mean, the military schools that I went through in Germany were all integrated. I mean, it was no big deal. Um, I remember my favorite teacher in, in first grade was a, was a black lady. Mrs. McCoy, and she was just, you know, she remember going to her house uh, for dinner on a couple of occasions, and and in the in the military, I mean, your best friends, uh, I mean, it just wasn't a big deal. You grew up, and, and and what dawned on me was, was when they decided to integrate schools. I remember going to one of the junior high schools I went to was was a school that had been a totally black school in Virginia, and we were bused the longest distance to get there. And I, I couldn't figure it out. I said, what's going on here? Now, I, I did find out when we went to that school, the whole facility was far, uh, was older, less kept up. I remember seeing a rat scurry across the classroom one day. And, and I, I, it was just an aspect of saying, you know, so much of the world is behind what, what you know, the, at least the families had grown used to in the military because it, it already happened for decades. So it was kind of feeling like, well, it's about time. <laughs> it's about time the rest of the world just start living together and, and not making, you know, make, it's no big deal. It's okay. So I, I think it's, you know, I, I, I celebrated that decision because it needs to start with the kids. It needs to have, children need to be able to learn that, to, to, to appreciate the diversity of America. And I think once, you know, kids are able to change so much uh, easier than, than adults can, and, and so um, so that would really dawn on me by saying, you know, yeah, it makes sense, guys, come on, get on with this. Mm -hmm. So when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, did you have kind of a similar reaction? It was just, by, by his assassination after um, Robert Kennedy and his, I think, you know, like all of us, our reaction was enough is enough, you know? Enough is enough. You just felt like that this country was losing its control, and uh, and that things were being settled by crazy people who decide to go in the history books. And you got you got you got a point of being angry. And, and obviously, I think, you know, um, uh, Martin Luther King. Um, unfortunately, I think his assassination kind of made a lot of people realize that this is something that's maybe they weren't taking the message as seriously as they should. Um, because this is an individual, when you realize that he did everything in a peaceful way, he was asking for things that Abraham Lincoln was saying should have occurred after the Civil War, um, and and someone actually take his life uh, away for it. it. It just didn't seem fair. So, it, it was very very dark days, very dark days. Okay. Now, uh, when you were going to McClintock High. Mm -hmm. No, outside, you know, I, I got bitten by, you know, uh, I remember being the president of the band, and um, it was fun. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed that position in terms of organizing. You know, we always took a tour through California and, and various things and, and got to know. I, I, you know, I became very good friends with this young lady that eventually became my wife. Uh, she was uh, uh, the treasurer of the anthem. There'd be a point in time where we rip out the Confederate flag the reaction to the Confederate flag was th three times that of the American flag. 
it got people, uh, it was, and I always stood there, and you know, I, I, I'm from the north, you know, and, and, and I just, I went, this is scary. I know they still do, I doubt they still do that, but there was that, there, you know, there was, there were pockets, and, um, and, and during this, you know, I remember some people, you know, when MLK was, was assassinated, saying, you know, well, you know, he deserved it, you know, it's just, it was kind of scary. And that's what was most scary about the whole thing, that, that there were, at that time, it, it was just two different points of view. But, yeah, the Confederacy was well and alive in Virginia and probably still is today. I don't think they've outlined the, outlawed the Confederate flag, but, you know, I always thought, you know, that's, it's historical, yes, but to some people in that audience in that football stadium, it also represented something else. But, mm. And they'd play Dixie, and, and people would react more to Dixie than the national anthem. Yeah. yeah. So coming out west, that was very different. That was very different. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was, you know. Uh, are we rolling? Yes. Oh. We've been rolling. Oh, oops. We got about, uh, on this tape, we got about 25 minutes here. Okay. Okay. But, but you know, uh, yeah, so... Um, Mm -hmm. And the president, and uh, you played the trumpet, right? Yeah, played the trumpet. Went to ASU, played the trumpet in the marching band for a couple of years. Um, were you were, looking to be a music major, or what was kind of your? Not experience? really. And I started out as a business major. Um, then I, where I really got involved politically, and I really enjoyed it, was at ASU. I, I, um, I got involved with with ASASU as associate students, and uh, ran for the state senate. Um, uh, and um, and it really got a kick out of you know making decisions that would affect uh, some of the issues that we're going through. Um, then I ran for activities vice president and and won in my sophomore year, and uh, um, it was my junior year. I think my junior year, and uh, I became uh, ahead of all all the entertainment and concerts for the campus. And I probably have one little note of history at ASU is that I was the last person ever to have a student-sponsored rock band in Gamage Auditorium. Um, it wasn't really a rock band. It was Flash Cadillac and the Continental Kids, um, a 50s group. You probably, you probably know them. And, um, and I worked so hard on that. We had most of Gamage sold out. And... Um, and uh, sit in the middle of the auditorium. And in those days, they didn't have the basketball arena. They had an um, old gymnasium that they had a concert in the year before, and the whole power went out in the middle of the concert. <laughs> and and had a mini riot in their hands. The students were upset. They couldn't fix it and everything else. So I, was convi I convinced the administration we, got, we have to use Gamage. And there was a director of Gamage, Warren Sumners was his, was his name, and he was just very proper, always wore a nice suit and tie, and... And he didn't like the idea, but you know the administration had to give us something, um, and so um, everything went well until uh, students started to get up and start clapping and things of that sort. And you saw the grand tier that is in the gamage, which is only connected by the sides. You actually saw the thing moving up and down. And I went, oh gosh! And then the drummer, for some reason, whipped out a six-pack of beer. And, and or one of the guitar players and brought out to the edge of the stage and the drummer did a solo on the six pack of beer. It burst and it sprayed beer all over the front seats of Gamage Auditorium. After that concert, I was given, a, you know, the, the administration said, no, we'll never allow you in this Gamage Auditorium again. And, um, and it was, it, yeah, it, to this day, they never had a student sponsored concert in there. We had to go elsewhere. Had my hands tied. So we went, we had our concerts, uh, uh, another big group of the Smothers Brothers. I don't remember them. We got them to, <laughs> Bob, the video guy, it's about our age. The Smothers Brothers were cool. I mean, they were, you know, they were fired from CBS and everything. They did a concert and we sponsored them at the Celebrity Theater. So we had to go off campus to do our concerts from that celebrity point. Celebrity Theater's not bad. It wasn't bad. It was a cool concert. It was neat. But, uh, you know, I got, and, and I know we, we had other issues with administration. We had a of all people we, we fought with the administration was that um, uh, the Billy Graham crusade wanted to come out to ASU. And they, they had this policy 
at ASU, the, they said, no, we, we couldn't have Billy Graham because Frank Cush doesn't want Billy Graham in that stadium. We said, well, why not? You know, uh, there was a Rolling Stones concert that, that occurred there, which was a few years before, and they said, well, this is a, it's a religious function. Uh, so I said, you know, I'm, I, under the Constitution, as a public institution, so we really just fought on that principle, and they, they backed down, and they had a, the, the Graham could use the stadium, and, and it was the principle of the fact of equal access of facilities for all groups. And that, that, of course, has been, you know, the federal government has passed, Congress passed a law that said you have to provide equal access of, of any group. As long as, you know, you meet the rules, pay the price, you shouldn't have to pay more, or you shouldn't be restricted because of necessarily uh, what you stand for. So that was, that was kind of a, one of those fights with the administration that you felt like, okay, you know, we're, we're upholding the Constitution. It was fun. So I got the bug of political science, changed my major to political science, and then, uh, thank goodness, got in law school because I don't know what I would have done just with a bachelor's degree in political sci and, and uh, uh, went through law school and graduated in 78. 1978? Mm -hmm, from law school. At ASU? ASU. So uh, once you finished up at ASU, your law degree, what was a huh, um, couple of things. I, I went, uh, when I was in law school, I went one summer over to London, went to school at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, enjoyed that enormously. Got into all the old inns of court and, and uh, went to a couple of trials, the old Bailey, and watched the, the, the British put on trials like theater. It's the most amazing thing, you know. The judges were everyone wears the wigs, even the lawyers, and the and the accused is still stands in a, in a metal cage, and and there's no the, the the fighting between lawyers are more subdued. They they say they kind of work on getting to the truth instead of trying to to be adversarial. They I remember having discussions. They thought the American legal system was barbaric, you know. So that was enormous. That that helped me kind of get a feel of of. And I really wanted to go into litigation. Um, then. Um, I worked uh, on the Hill one summer in 1976 uh, for John Rhodes, the minority leader, um, and uh, worked in the minority leader's office, which is today the speaker's office, right off the rotunda. I never could understand why the speaker wouldn't want to be in the minority leader's office, because our offices looked right down the mall. It was the most beautiful views from our, from our offices, and the speaker used to be on the back side, which would be the east side of the Capitol, looking out the parking lot. So they. I think it was Newt that uh, changed the, the side of the, of the, but I'm sorry, I'm getting off. But that, you know, I, I was able to watch someone like John Rhodes, where he was the old guard working with Udall. It was so, it was so refreshing because you would, he would have meetings. I remember having meetings um, as a staff person with Hubert Humphrey and John Rhodes sitting down together saying, let's figure out a way to get this done. Udall and Rhodes would work together. They're opposite parties. Uh, you had the Arizona delegation always working together to bring quality projects back here to Arizona. It was just a, a lot more cooperation than, than just being on different sides from a philosophical viewpoint. So I, I enjoyed that enormously. Then worked in the legislature uh, as an attorney uh, for the Rules Committee for a while on the Senate side. Found out very quickly that there is no constitution in the state of Arizona. I, I, as a young whippersnapper, they'd send me to committees and I would say, well, you can't pass this law because it's, it's unconstitutional. I remember being told, certainly by one individual, Representative Stump, remember Bob Stump? And looking at me and saying, we can pass any law we want to, and if it's against the Constitution, the courts can fix it afterwards. And uh, <laughs> I would say, okay. And, um, and then after law school, I, I, I went to practice with Steve Yarbrough, uh, and uh, in private practice for 30 some years. Um, Did you start that? Hmm? Private practice? Yeah, private practice starting in Tempe with a number of attorneys, different uh, partners, uh, and then moved our practice out to Chandler. And, um, and this month I've just closed my private practice. It's been kind of an emotional thing and a little bit, you know, just after 30 some years. And I'm, I'm working now for the uh, Attorney General's office as an assistant. AG in the area of, uh, of civil litigation, risk management, or, uh, and, and we basically defend the state on lawsuits that are filed against the state of Arizona. So did you start your private practice in 80? Passed the bar in, in 19, 1979 um, and just basically started yeah, in Tempe uh, 
uh, I, I started working for this firm that Steve was a part of. We didn't become partners until a few years afterwards. I remember my first, uh, they put me in the law library as my first office, <laughs> a little typing table, and um, worked at uh, one, two, three different locations, 10 years at the Real Salado Bank building, which is on Southern Avenue in Tempe, and, and got mainly in the litigation, but the whole gamut of things, uh, personal injury, um, uh, civil litigation. I, I like being in the courtroom, so I um, but in, in, in the small practice, you end up doing whatever comes through that door. So I've done bankruptcy, criminal, whole gamut of things, and, um, and, uh, and start specializing a little bit more after the years went by. Um, so tell me about your wife, what her name is, and when you, when you uh, got married. Her name is Nancy. Uh, again, as I said, we, we knew each other in high school. Um, we actually uh, were in student government together at ASU. Um, she went, she uh, had a Navy, um, uh, a Navy uh, scholarship in, in the nursing college. Uh, she was selected to receive the scholarship. So when we graduated, I went to law school and she went in the Navy and as a nurse and was stationed in Oakland, California at the big Naval Hospital that used to be there. And uh, she was in the Navy for about three years. I was in law school in three years and, and she moved back here. and, and we, we uh, started dating again and, and eventually got married. Um, so I, I always thought that she had to go to the Navy and I had to, so I could get through law school. I, I don't, there's no way I could have been married and still go to law school. Law school, uh, law school I, I completely got immersed in that. And, and I quickly found out uh, that it's, uh, it's very challenging. You're, you're, you're there with a lot of smart individuals. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, uh, she, um, she's, gosh, she, uh, she, uh, uh, she teaches at Gateway Community College now, a nursing program, but she actually went back to ASU, got her graphic design degree, and she's a great artist, and, and she was a graphic designer for a number of years, worked for a couple of advertising firms, um, uh, stayed home when we had our boys, uh, then went back and, and now is in, in teaching um, uh, at Gateway. She just retired from the Navy. Uh, she reached the rank of captain, which is colonel in the Navy. Um, probably the highest rank you can get in the, in the nurse corps is there's only one admiral. Um, and uh, she had an unbelievable career. She uh, did her service in all over the world, in, in Iceland, in Guam. She was in Desert Storm uh, for, for about four months. I took care of the boys while she, she was there. And she's uh, been a commanding officer in units here in Phoenix. and in Long Beach and Nevada and, and um, in Washington, D.C. She had a, a couple of short stints. So, um, so now we're going to be, um, she's going to have the experience of um, next, well, in two weeks, on the 27th of May, be able to um, pin uh, uh, bars on my son's shoulder. He's going to follow in her footsteps. Uh, he's graduating from the Naval Academy and will be an ensign. And so it's, um, I know it's going to be very emotional for her to be able to, uh, to do that honor. Uh, she's, a, she's actually, um, they would allow her to actually uh, do that honor of, of doing the commissioning for her son. So that will be um, an emotional time for her and, and our son is going to carry on her, her Navy, um, Navy tradition. Navy, we're very close to, uh, Navy is part of our family yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, San Diego is our second home. <laughs> yeah, it's a good place to have a second home. Yeah, it's a good place. Yes, yeah, she would go to San Diego quite often. Um, what year were you guys married? 1982. Now, did you come to Chandler soon after that? Or? Well, I moved to Chandler. I bought my first home in Chandler in 1980. And, um, and then, uh, along with my brother, as a matter of fact, we bought the house together and I had to buy his interest out. You know, we, we said whoever got married first got the house. So, um, that's where we lived first, uh, in North Chandler, uh, in the Pulte housing area near Shawnee Park. And, and it was a great neighborhood, young families. Um, and then I have two boys, um, Andrew, who's at ASU, majoring in photography. He got his mother's artistic inclinations. And then Kevin, who will be graduating from the Naval Academy um, shortly. So they're both out of the house and we're empty nesters and trying to adjust. 
so let's talk about uh, let's talk about how you ended up being sort of politically involved in Canada. Good question. You know, it's um, I remember when uh, once I got involved in a lot of ways. Um, you know, when you're we're in your practice, you 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 get out and you join groups to get known in the community. Uh, you know, to, to you know try to you know meet other business, uh, uh, let people know that you have a practice. I, I became very involved in the um, Rotary Club. First of all, the Mesa West Rotary Club, and then I moved, then I transferred out to the Chandler Rotary Club, which I could never understand. They would have their luncheons at the um, at the Chandler Regional Hospital. So I said, great, I'm going to have a kind of hospital food once a week. But actually it wasn't too bad. It was, it was one of the, Chandler Rotary was one of the oldest clubs around. I mean, it, it had all the, um, all I call old timers, you know, the Sabas and the, and, and it was my first time to get to know these people. And, and I got to know the history of Chandler by, I, I recognize that name, that's Saba. I, you know, I recognize that name, that's, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, uh, Basha. And, and, and I was fascinated by, this, this community that had all these old, these families that we even heard of in Tempe because their their roads named after them, you know, Dobson, and 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 so um, and so that was enjoyable. Then I actually joined a Lions Club here, Ojo Rojo Lions Club. Um, it says Red Eye Lions Club, and a lot of a lot. Of, and Bobby knows all the people in Rojo Rojo, you know, Marty Wright, and and. Uh, John Ferris and, and all these, uh, um, uh, the old public works director, Bob, um, help me, uh, we were just talking about him at breakfast, um, old Barry age. Weber. Yeah, Barry Weber. Sorry. And so I got to, and a lot of st uh, city staff people were there and I got to know them and, 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 and went to the, we would do things at the parks and things of that sort. And I met an individual named Jerry Brooks. And he, he saw this young attorney and said, I want you to get involved. And he, uh, I said, I'll be happy to. And I got appointed to uh, the first uh, downtown redevelopment task force in 19, I think it was 1986 or something, or in the early 80s. And I, I saw this downtown. I went, you know, uh, let me premise this and if I, if, tell me to stop. But one of the things that, that Tempe did for me in those 10 years is that when I, you know, I, I, I've always had a great interest in city planning and, and, and architecture and zoning. And, and, and what I saw was I, you know, Tempe was going through its enormous growth. Like I said, you know, when I went to McClintock High School, it was a two-lane cement slab road, and, and Tempe was growing you know, like we did in the last decade. And, and, but I saw a difference in Tempe. I said, you know, Tempe is, is developing in a way that's different than perhaps neighboring communities, i.e. Mesa, it's going through the same thing. I said, why? Why do the cities look different? Why, why are the cities? And what I learned in Tempe is that, you know, Mesa in those years uh, had this attitude of whatever happens, happens. You know, and so uh, if, a bit, you know, if we have three gas stations at our intersection, that's fine. Tempe was saying, no, you know, we're, we're going to control that growth. We're going to dictate design, where things should be, what we want. They had a vision of where they wanted to go. And so, when I went to Chandler, I, I, I got this enormous concern that, is this going to be another Tempe or is it going to be a Mesa? I don't want to say that. I just, but, you know, if you, if you talk to the mayor of Mesa today, he'll admit to this. Um, um, you know, he said there was a different attitude. And so, so um, instead of taking a laissez-faire sort of attitude of development, I think cities can, if they do it soon enough, decide what they want to be. You know what they want to, you know what what they want to be for their citizens, what they can be, how they're going to design, where things should be, and and develop an image and a vision of your city. Um, so you know, I, I remember meeting with Jerry Brooks. I remember going to downtown and saying, "This could be something," because Tempe. I remember Tempe's downtown when you didn't go there. You you left at night. There was a major murder at a hotel downtown uh, Tempe. Uh, it was. Uh, they had a number of what are known as biker bars, and and downtown Tempe was was something you drove through, and you certainly didn't go after night. It was just totally, and but they had a plan and a vision, and they stuck with it. And and I saw that in downtown Chandler. I said, you know, what's this could be something. We ha we have as much history in downtown Chandler as they do in downtown Tempe. As much as you know, even to some degree, probably even more impressive in terms of names like Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and those type of individuals. So, 
So I got down with the Downtown Redevelopment Task Force and, and, and found out that, you know, there was really no, organ, no vision, no organization. We had a downtown business association that didn't really have any power to do anything. Got involved in the DCCP, helped write the first charter, and really felt like it, before downtown could ever happen, you'd have to have an organization like Tempe did with the Downtown Merchants Association. You've got to have, you got to have people you know, more in control of what they want their downtown to be other than just kind of a branch of government, so to speak. So that was my first involvement. Then he pointed me to this wonderful organization called the Down, uh, East Valley Behavioral Health Association. I became a vice president there, and the whole purpose was to get more behavioral health money out to the East Valley. I had a lot of fun just doing that sort of thing. And, and, um, and then Jerry came to me once and said, you need to run for city council. And that's a story in itself. What was, was there kind of a, uh, an overriding vision that they started to look at and really focus on for the downtown? You know, the problem was they didn't know how to do it. They, 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 you know, it, it's the stakeholders weren't part of the process. It was the stakeholders that really wanted to, do, you know, they, you know, cities can do only so much in terms, they, the cities can, can give incentive, can say, you know, we're here to help you. But some of the worst developments in the world are those that the city actually does. There's some downtowns. Um, Rockville is, is an example uh, where we, you know, we hired Mark Pence from. And, uh, and one of the reasons I, I, I found Mark Pence to be uh, an attractive city manager for our city was I went to Rockville. It's outside of Washington, D.C. He showed me a downtown. And I said, it was actually an old mall. They actually tore down all the old buildings of downtown and built this mall. And I said, who did that? He said, well, the city did. The city thought it would be great just to have a lot of this retail. It was so dysfunctional. It had, it had no, had no um, pedestrian or people feel at all. Rockville actually went out and got approval from the voters to tear down that mall and then build a new downtown to look like their old downtown before the mall was built. <laughs> Because they wanted that character, they wanted that density, they wanted things of that sort. So, you know, back in those days, you know, we just, we all agreed that San Marcos was, had to stay. But outside of that, we really didn't know. And, and, and you had to get not only the landowners, but those who were going to invest, uh, the store owners and things of that sort. Again, similar to what happened in Tempe. Tempe did not redevelop downtown. They provide a lot of the cash, and it's not cheap. But... The, it was the merchant association to decide what they wanted downtown to be in terms of the stores and things of that sort. So, so that's what the importance of once the DCCP was formed, they started visioning much more effectively. 